Hello, everyone. Wow, it is bright. Yes, there are people there. Um, got my clicker. So my name is James. Um, I'm, I'm deputy CEO of Ocado Group, but my main role is running the technology business at Ocado. This is a, probably a minority of presentations that doesn't have AI in the title, but spoiler alert, there's quite a lot of AI in, in uh, what we do, if you haven't heard enough AI in the last uh, three days. What I'm going to attempt to do is run through 25 years of our history, our innovation, and our development in 20 minutes, hopefully giving you a bit of inspiration of how we think about our development process and, what, and the problems we are trying to solve. But it is going to be a quick run, run through. I wanted to start the talk, actually not with technology, just a bit of background on the problem we're trying to solve and the supermarket industry generally. So I'm sure everyone in this room has shopped in a traditional supermarket in person. Hopefully, many of you have also shopped online for your food. But the supermarket industry as we know it today is about 100 years old. It evolved on the eastern seaboard and the Midwest of the US in the 20s and 30s. And I like to describe it as an absolutely genius business model. It took what was a very high service industry with people helping you with your food, delivering it to your house, and it persuaded us, the customer, to do a very large portion of the work. You know, in other cities, perhaps less so in London, it is normally the case that you get in your car, you use your own fuel to drive to a big out-of-town box, which is essentially a warehouse. You know, this is the, the back of a supermarket. We obviously didn't want to put any of our clients uh, front and center. And you will walk around what is ostensibly a warehouse, and you will select your own food, and then you will queue up to pay, and you'll load your own car, and you'll drive it home. And so you're really doing a large amount of the work in getting the food into your house. It's also a genius business model because if you were good enough to win the property wars in the sort of mid-20th centuries and you've got the right portfolio of properties on the right street corners, you're kind of locked in with a pretty solid business model that's quite hard to disrupt. It is, however, also a very difficult business to run. It is a cost domination business. It is low margin, there is competition, and you need to take as much cost as you can out. Let's come up with self-checkouts. Let's, let's take a little bit uh, more work away from, from our employees in order to eke out low single-digit margins. Now, when Ocado was founded in 2000, the founder's vision was to go back and, and do a lot of that work for the customer again. So actually to pick the products that they wanted from a range of tens of thousands, say 50,000 products, to assemble them, put them into a neat order, drop them off at the customer's house, not disturb their day. And the only way of doing that, while playing with these very razor-thin margins, was to reinvent the entire grocery supply chain. Our first attempt involved a lot of automation. We knew that we needed to take a lot of labor content out of the grocery shopping process, and we built this facility in Hatfield. I should say I'm a software engineer. I joined 20 years ago this week, so I've seen 80% of this, and my first role was writing software for these conveyor systems. The facility we built had a lot of advantages. As I was saying, reinventing the grocery supply chain involved putting a lot of volume into one site, reducing food waste, reducing theft, removing the need for distribution centers. All of that cost being taken out enabled us to pay for the delivery. The technology we used, we borrowed, really, from other industries. So this facility has, if I remember correctly, 35 kilometers of conveyor. That conveyor may have traditionally been used in baggage handling. In fact, I think it's more conveyor than is in uh, Heathrow Terminal 5. And on average, we were definitely more successful at not losing people's broccoli than Terminal 5 is at uh, not losing your, your baggage. Um, we borrowed automation from pharmaceuticals, from manufacturing. We stuck it together, and we captured many of the advantages that I was talking about. These were efficient. This was an efficient facility that put that volume in one space, had lower energy uses, lower food waste, and, and managed to run the Ocado business for a decade. It did, however, have a number of problems. It is very sequential in its process. If something went wrong with one of these pieces of conveyor, it essentially created a traffic jam, and the whole site came down. It was not very modular. You needed to build a big, you know, multi-hundred million pound investment facility to, to replicate this. And so we, we took our lessons from this facility, and we decided to start again and reinvent it from scratch to try and overcome some of the disadvantages of our early stages of automation. What you're seeing here, 
I don't actually know which one this is. We have 29 of these live around the world at this point. I, I suspect this is Luton. Um, you're seeing a big block of food, a big grid. These white bins that you can see, the 21 bins high. And within here, you have the tens of thousands of products, and you have custom orders that are picked or part picked. And these bots that are running around, they can, it's very hard to see them doing it, they can pick up a bin into their belly, and they can drop it off, typically to a human, to pick and pack groceries. Now, these facilities, they capture some of the advantages I spoke about earlier. They have scale, they reduce food waste, they reduce energy usage, but they have the modularity and the redundancy, because all the moving parts are in the bots, in order to provide very, very high performance facilities. This still was not really good enough to really tackle the cost base of grocery in order to provide the service that we, and now our partners, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, would like. So we then subsequently have now taken things to the next level. And this is definitely Luton. Um, this is our on-grid robotic pick product. I did say there'd be a bit of AI. It gets a mention here. Um, it, it was important to us that we could sell this technology around the world to different grocers, and we certainly didn't have the time and the bandwidth to train our robotics on all the many hundreds of thousands of different products, different SKUs, shape, uh, sh shapes and sizes. And so we needed an AI model and a vision system that really could learn to look for the first time at a set of products, identify the boundaries of where those products were, work out a strategy for how to pick them up, and pick and pack the groceries for customers. But the, the technology at play here is really a cousin of the generative AI that we're using in, in large language models, but rather than a big corpus of words, it has a large data set of human or actually other robotic moves that have been successful or otherwise in order to pick and pack groceries successfully. We still frequently, when something goes wrong, have humans in the loop. So if something does go wrong, it encounters a product it hasn't seen before and doesn't quite get it right first time, we can actually dial in and become the robot. But that is all just new training data. And it, it happens a very small fraction percentage of the time. Um, but when it does, the human can think creatively, come up with a new strategy. But then that goes back into the model in order to help our robotics pick next time. We're currently doing, if I can go back to that, I won't go back to that. We're currently doing about a million picks a week in our lead facility here. And we're on course to, by the end of this year, we'll be at a run rate of doing about a quarter of a billion picks a year around the world, from Japan to the US, the UK, uh, with this technology. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on one of the lessons that we have learned and some of the sort of ancillary technologies we've developed in order to make these facilities work. We are quite proud of the risks that we take. We are doing, in many cases, quite long-reaching uh, research and development to bring these systems to life. Um, and when it comes to software, of course, you can take a very iterative approach. You can trial, and you can learn, and you can, you can um, start with an MVP, and you can improve on it. When it comes to hardware products or, or building these facilities, the big ones can do you know, over a billion pounds of grocery sales. It's not really the thing to be done to just uh, suck it and see and build one and see if it works. And so we now make very extensive use of uh, digital twins and simulations. Um, we are typically, at the moment, we will be uh, running virtually about half a millennia of ro robotic operations a year in the virtual world in order to optimize and actually design specific facilities around the world as we deploy them. Just coming back to our business model for a moment. So we have a lot of cool automation that you've, you've seen. Actually, a large portion of what we built for ourselves was in the software world. Um, we built and are very proud today co-owners of Ocado.com that if anyone here is uh, from London will uh, uh, be familiar with the vans on the, on the road. So we built this technology to power Ocado.com. But we recognized that doing digital grocery was a problem that grocers around the world were trying to solve. Now, some grocers are very scaled organizations. They're very good at technology. You know, if you look at what, what Walmart is doing in the US. But I would say your average grocer is, you know, they are a retailer. They're not a technology company. And many of them around the world had had attempts at doing grocery delivery online. Um, often involves an integrator, system one, system two, bolted together, a lot of projects that didn't work uh, particularly well. And what we recognize we had, both in the automation that we developed for ourselves and all of the software that surrounds it, 
is a turnkey platform. So for a sort of non-digitally native retailer, allow them to take our technology, whether that's the user interfaces, the customer websites, the mobile, the supply chain, the fulfillment, the last mile, the traveling salesman problem, the warehouses, take all of that technology and put their excellent product, brand, retail knowledge into building a, a first-rate online business. And so we built what we have branded today, Ocado Smart Platform. We have 13 grocery customers around the world using this platform, ranging from Lotte in Korea to Sobeys in Canada, Kroger in, in the US. And most of those uh, partners are using the entirety of our platform end to end. I wanted to just run through a little bit of a, a um, use case here because the data flows of our platform are every bit as important as any one piece of software or any of the automation that is very cool to look at that I, that I showed you earlier. Um, we have, and this is the last time I mentioned it, 130 use cases of AI deployed across this platform. Now, much of that is what I would refer to as classic AI. We've actually been deploying AI for uh, 10 years uh, into this platform. But it is a living, breathing organism, really, as a, as a platform, and any change that happens that any customer with thousands and thousands of customers interacting with it, uh, any change a customer makes has onward effects across the rest of the platform and the, and the data flows. And we need intelligence, predictive capabilities, and AI in order to make the necessary changes. Um, to run through this one particular example, our clients, when they deploy this platform, they let their customers edit their order right up until the last minute before we start picking and packing the groceries. And customers take full advantage of that, and they put 50 things in their basket, and then they change their mind, and they come back. So in this imaginary scenario, let's imagine at the very last minute, one of our client's customers decided that they didn't want the fresh strawberries that they had in their basket that we'd been holding for them, and said, no, you know what, I'm going to swap that out for some tinned peaches. A number of things have to happen immediately across our platform. So the first thing is, actually, did we forecast that that was likely to happen? Actually, while this might seem like an odd choice at the last minute, actually, customers are en masse very predictable. And so actually, did we have the tinned peaches in stock that we, uh, someone may have wanted to swap into? And then can we promise that to the customer? So we, we have real live stock availability. We know where every item of food is in the warehouse. And so can we promise that to the customer? So yes, we can. Customer manages to swap that in their basket. But now, potentially, we have a problem because we've got some fresh strawberries. They don't last very long. And this is the very last minute. And now we have an extra, an extra set on the shelf. Now, we do our best to predict that. But you, of course, are always dealing with a standard deviation of error. And we've got some excess strawberries. What are we going to do? Well, actually, what we can do live is look for another customer who might buy them and discount them on the website in real time. So as you are checking out on Ocado.com or on Sobeys in, in, in Canada or in on Aeon and Green Beans in Japan, actually, you may notice that there's something called flash sales, often at the end of the checkout. Well, that is the live response to our real-time stock availability and what other customers have just done. And so by offering a small discount, we managed to get those strawberries in someone else's basket. Of course, now we have a different product to pick and pack. Maybe the strawberries were in the chill section of the warehouse. The peaches are in the ambient section of the warehouse. Actually, strawberries are easily bruised. Canned peaches are bruisers. So we can't even put those in the same bag for the customer. Different part of the warehouse, different bag. So actually, the entire orchestration of the building, maybe we're dispatching a bot now to dig out the peaches from the bottom of the stack. Um, we are replanning the entire customer's order. We're replanning everyone's orders because we now have to pick a different set of um, orders in that facility. Again, that happens within microseconds of the customer telling us they've changed their mind. And then the last mile, we run a very, very complex traveling salesman problem. It is a constrained traveling salesman problem. We have weight limits. We have limits on temperature regimes. We have cube limits. We need to know how long it takes to stop at individual customers' houses. And this customer's really just messed us about because actually that can of peaches now weighs more than the strawberries. And we've gone over the weight limit of the van that we intended to use to go to their house. What, what we're really doing is we're doing tens of millions of optimizations every second that customers are shopping. At any point in time, we have a live plan of how we are going to do deliveries 
and we can change that in real time. Now, all of this technology is required to run an efficient online grocery business that is taking very low value items, you know, we're talking, say, three US dollars for a typical item, and squeezing every little bit of cost out of the operating processes in order to get that item into a customer's home. And it is typically the case that our supermarket clients are not in the business of creating this sort of technology. And hence, smart platform and its success being deployed around the world. We don't rest on our laurels. Um, this now is the latest iteration of our robotic system. Uh, I suspect this will actually be the last major iteration of, of our robotic system. Um, that there's not, there aren't too many wins to go after with this automation. But one of the problems, one of the last problems we had with our old setup is quite heavy bots. You know, they, they are lugging around cases of water. They need to be pretty robust. But those heavy bots, and when they can run in their thousands on a given site, they need a lot of infrastructure. They need a lot of safety barriers. They need a lot of, um, you know, they're difficult to lift and maintain. And so we still tended towards very large scale sites. These bots here are performance, in performance terms, like to like replicas of our old bot. They travel at four meters per second. They pass each other with about two millimeters spare. They can access the same 21 high stack. But they are designed from the ground up using additive manufacturing in mind. Um, topology optimization, for any mathematicians in the room, you know, the ability to take a uh, material and analyze the stresses we want to put on it and work out exactly how much we can remove from that structure, leaving it just as strong as we need it in order to do what we need to do. And in fact, when you, when you apply those mathematical principles, you often end up with shapes that just are not possible to manufacture using traditional methods, whether that is injection molding with plastic or subtractive manufacturing um, with metal. And so by starting again, we managed to get these bots down to about a quarter to a third of their original weight, which allows us to shrink the grid, remove crash barriers. And so a bit early to be announcing at this point, but as this technology is rolled out, and this is now live in two facilities, and we gain confidence in it, we'll be able to start to deploy our automation in much, much smaller footprints with very different use cases um, and move away from the big basket next day grocery order that we have uh, become famous for around the world. Um, that's 25 years in, um, uh, actually I did it a bit faster, 18 in 18 minutes. Um, I don't know, I, I, I wish I could see in the room, but how many people, I'm just curious now, this is a very educated technology audience, how many people in the room knew that Ocado was primarily a technology business rather than a food delivery business before I did my talk. Okay, so actually, even after we've been in the technology business for a decade, it's probably about half the room realized that's the case. So this is, you know, it is a great British success story of technical innovation that was a needs must development to support one particular business. But as it turns out now, is a huge export around the world deploying British built technology. Although I say that we have colleagues building this technology in about eight countries now um, around the world to help a, a, a traditional industry revolutionize itself and offer higher service to customers. So with that, I thank you very much. Mm -hmm.